The Prowler, Part 14 I awoke to a raven, cawing at my window. I stared at its slumber-eyed, but still took in its black magnificence. It turned its head to the right, and as it did, my chamber door opened, and in walked a hesitant James. I had to chuckle to myself. It was as if the raven was signaling James nearing demise, at the window, ready to usher him to the afterlife, ready to usher him to hell. James slithered to me, with his head hung low, and laid the tray on my lap, consisting of my morning paper and coffee. He tried to crawl off in shame, but as he reached the door, I reminded him I required his services today. I informed him he needed to clean the carriage inside and out in preparations for my date with my love, Lady Smith. Also, he needed to arrange a private dining room for the two of us at Lombardo's, the finest Italian restaurant in London. I dismissed him with a wave of my hand and opened the paper to read of my latest exploits. The headline was catching. Prowler returns to Denmark Street, slays 21st victim. The Prowler struck again last night, back at his old familiar trappings of Denmark Street. The body of Beatrice Dumwitty, a suspected lady of the evening, was found horrifically massacred in one of the side alleys. Dumwitty, age 44, was found with a hatchet-sized hole in her head, and her womanly parts were removed as trophies. The Prowler's poem was laid atop her person as well. Dumwitty, whose residence was nearby, left no friends or loved ones behind. Another horrific crime indeed. A question I have, dear readers, is what in the world is this madman doing with the parts he collects from his victims? Perhaps we shall never know. Until tomorrow, dear readers, stay safe. A proper article from that filth peddler for once. I'm slightly impressed, but not too much, but slightly. He also brought up a subject matter I've talked about earlier, wanting to go in-depth on in this journal, and that is the storage and reasonings of my trophy collection. First off, breakfast. Then I will return and document my reasonings. Such things shouldn't be discussed before a proper breakfast. I exited my chambers to unwanted pleasantries from the help. I thought such shite was over with, after the killings of their colleagues. But these resilient fuckers are back at high spirits. Damn my life. I walked past every smiling face and growled until I reached the table. Father was there. Nigel was not. A plate of eggs, biscuits, and sausages greeted me on the table, accompanied by a cup of fresh-brewed coffee. Father and I talked of upcoming family charitable affairs when I finished breakfast and returned to my chambers. I collected my journal from the desk along with a pen and moved to the bookcase. I stood in front of it and placed my fingers on the top binding of the book, Anatomy and Curiosities of the Human Body, pulling it towards me. As I did this, the bookcase moved to the side, collapsing behind the wall, revealing my secret chamber. I grabbed a candle from the wall to light my way, and secluded myself inside. Mr. Johns asked the question, What do I do with my trophies? Well, the answer is simple. I preserve them in a special liquid and store them in glass jars I procured from the medical college. They surround me as I speak, secured on the bookcases inside my secret room, alongside my private library of books on the occult. Which brings me to question number two. What am I going to do with said trophies? Well, as I said, 
I'm very big into the occult. I have all the rarest books on demonology and the raising of spirits and dark forces. I'm going to raise a demon. <laughs> or at least try to, anyway. The parts that I have collected shall be my vessel to bring a demon into this world. At least that's the general idea. As a founding member of the secret society of the cloaked prophets, it is my duty to pull off such a task. The other members expect it of me. So I have my reasons for collecting my trophies. I'm not just some madman taking parts. And now you know. I heard the chiming of the grandfather clock and realized time had gotten away from me. My date with my love approached. I blew out the candle and left my secret chamber, giving another pull on the book, closing the bookcase behind me. I made sure all preparations were taken care of for the evening with James, then proceeded to get ready for my rendezvous. I picked out a fine black suit and laid it out on the bed, then trimmed up my rogue facial hairs and made sure the mustache and goatee were looking accordingly. Brushed and waxed, I was ready to go, looking a proper gentleman. I grabbed my top hat and cloak and was out the door into the waiting carriage. To Lady Smith's Manor and be quick about it, I barked at James. I arrived on time promptly at seven and went inside to wait for my love, having a conversation with Lord Smith about the wedding as I waited. I noticed her from the corner of my eye, standing atop the staircase, looking beautiful as always, dressed in purple. We said our goodbyes to her father, and we were on our way. On our way to the carriage, my love dropped her handbag. She continued walking as I reached down to pick it up, and as I did, I looked up and saw James whisper something into her ear as she entered the carriage. What is this shite? I thought, trying to control my anger. I got up and quickly moved to the carriage. To the restaurant now, James. I ordered him as I went inside. As the carriage started to move, I asked my love what that foul-smelling miscreant said to her. And without hesitation, she told me. She said James whispered, If only you knew, you would not be here. Please, my lady, stay away. I have horrors to tell you. Son of a bitch, I exclaimed loudly. This drunkard just refuses to learn. My lady had a look of concern and confusion on her face. I proceeded to tell her of James' reckless behavior as of late, his actions last night, and the things he's been saying. He obviously doesn't know that you know my secret, so once again... He was trying to get me caught with exposing my secret to you. I sat there thinking, getting lost in my thoughts. I realized it became quiet. I looked over at my love, and before I could utter a word, she said sinisterly, He has to go. I must admit, I had never been more aroused in my life than at that very moment. My wife, my blood countess. I told her I agreed. He's just not trustworthy any longer. She smiled and looked out the window. Then she said something that cemented my love for her for lifetimes. I know how we should do it. I know how to dispose of James. Neatly and properly, my handsome husband. She said in all seriousness, with a slight grin across her face. We'll talk of it over dinner. I agreed, and we kissed. What a macabre, beautiful, deadly couple we are, I thought as the carriage pulled up to the restaurant. We exited the carriage and told James to wait for however long it took. We entered the restaurant and were ushered to the back to a private secluded table. We ordered the finest foods they had on the menu, accompanied with the finest drink, then began to talk. We conversed about everything, our wedding, our beautiful future, 
Then she wanted to know how it all started, what made me into the Prowler. This is an interesting question, my love, and one I knew you would want to know eventually, I said with a smile. I've never really thought about it. I have a hunger inside me, a rage that must be tamed, but I can't say for certain. Sometimes things just are, and I'm just a killer. She nodded her head and said, I understand. And as you know, I'm fine with you being the prowler. And don't mind that you've killed. You know I don't mind when I saw you standing in the stables. I wasn't scared, as a matter of fact. I knew, and you know this. However, now that we are to be married, you must cease your prowler activities. There can be no more murders. May I ask why? If you don't have a problem with my murderous pursuits, then why must I stop? I said confusingly. For one, we are to be married, and that brings with it a family, beautiful children, and I can't risk you being caught when our children are involved. Also, you will be the next Earl of Burlington soon. Your father is aging, and the title will be yours in no time, along with the responsibilities and everything that entails. If you are caught, you will ruin the history and legacy of your family's historic name. It must all end, my love. Your bloodthirsty work is done. The people will never forget the Prowler, she said with a wide smile. I sat and took in everything she had just said to me. Everything she said was true, and for the sake of our future and our family's future, I agreed, but under one condition. I must do away with the people in this world that have wronged me in some way. Parker Johns, James, and especially that bastard Jack the Ripper, I said in a stern voice. My love sat there, nodded her head, and smiled. I agree with your terms, and I'll even help you myself, she said devilishly. Excellent, my love, I exclaimed. Now tell me what you had in mind for James. She proceeded to tell me of a book of poisons she had been reading, and she knew the ingredients to make an untraceable poison that could be mixed into his wine, and it would look as if he succumbed from his drinking. I told her I loved it. He's so paranoid, he probably wouldn't let me close enough to kill him. Now this way, he won't suspect a thing. We'll do it once we return you to your manor. Me and my love devised a devilishly brilliant plan before leaving the table, then made our way back to the carriage. I grinned at James to proceed back to Lady Smith's manor, and we were off. You see, the plan was for me to ask to use the bathroom to handle some personal business, and while I was away, my love would invite James inside and ask what information he had to tell her. While listening to what he had to say, she would offer him some wine to get him comfortable. Now the mischievous part is I'm not really using the washroom. I'm actually retrieving the ingredients for the poison. I mix the ingredients and sneak my way back downstairs and slip the poison to my love while she's pouring another round of drinks. She then mixes it into James' wine and hands him the cup, where we then watch him die a slow, painful death. We arrived at the manor, and our plan went off without a hitch. As James sat there dying, choking on his own blood, I looked him in the eyes and informed him that his sad attempt to inform my love of my secret was futile, for she had already known. His eyes widened as my love came into view and smiled in his face. We both laughed as he finally died. I dragged his body back to the carriage and stuffed him inside, 
a gentleman such as myself shouldn't have to perform such physical work. I kissed my love good night and told her I would see her tomorrow. I then drove off in great haste back to the manor. I'll try and sneak his corpse back to his quarters and lay him in his bed while strewning a few bottles around the room, looking like he died from a long night of boozing. That's one down and two to go. Check James off the list. Now it's your turn, Jack. Your next. I would like to give a heartfelt thank you to the special friends of the channel for your overwhelming generosity. If you would like to support the channel, the link is below in the description. Also, please send me your stories and poems to duchessofdarkness27 at gmail.com. You can also find me on Instagram at duchess.ofdarkness and Twitter at Duchess of Dark and Two. I want to thank all my listeners for your kindness, your encouragement, and your support. It means the world to me. Thank you for joining me. Until next time.